couple of mantras for you. With your eyes closed, listen to these mantras. We are exploring the potential of the self. So in this exploration, the mantras can help you. Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karava Vahai Tejas Vinavati Tamastu Ma Vityusha Vahai Om Shanti 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 May the Lord protect us, may the Lord nourish us, may the Lord energize us, may the Lord make our efforts successful, may we not hate each other, peace be, peace be, peace be. Om Patram Karne Bishrunuyama Deva Patram Pashema Acha Biria Jatra Stirange Etushtuvagum Sustanu Bihi Vashema Deva Hidam Yadayu Sustina Yindro Vrutashrava Sustina Pusha Vishoveta Sustina Stadju Aristane Mihi Sustino Brahaspadir Dathadu. May we come to see only auspicious sights. May we come to hear only auspicious sounds. May we live a long life healthy with the sturdy limbs and healthy body. These are the intentions that you make. When you intend positive things, positive outcomes come. So with this prayer, let us begin our discussion. <coughs> Yesterday, we were talking about self-directed leadership. For the last three days, we were talking about self-directed leadership. And what is the case for self-directed leadership? How do you justify this idea of self-directed leadership? We heard about data-based leadership, analytic-based leadership, imagination-based leadership, knowledge-based leadership. These are the leadership styles that we are talking about. You collect data, analyze the data, and project, predict what can happen. And your decisions are based on that. Predictions based on data analysis. And the data is based upon the past. Something has happened in the past, and you collect data based on that, and then you analyze it, then you try to predict the future, and you take decisions based upon those predictions. So analysis, prediction, and then prescription. 
So this is what might happen. Accordingly, you are prescribed, a certain prescription is given to you, and then you take decisions based upon that. But the problem with this data is, data is based upon the past. And even knowledge is based upon the past. Because your knowledge is based upon data, that also is based upon the past. And your imagination is based upon that knowledge. Look at that, the connection between data, the past, data, knowledge, imagination. And then what we see is the world is fast changing. The world is very, is unpredictable. And since this fast changing world, the past knowledge wouldn't work. I told you the story yesterday. The past knowledge is not to help you. Imagination also will not help you. Analytics cannot help you. So we need a new way of adapting to the world, the changing world. A new way of s relating to the world. New solutions, that's what I want to say. We need a new solution. Not informed by the past. The past has already gone, dead and gone. And the future is something absolutely new. And we also have seen the change of, the pace of change is accelerating. Every five hours things are changing. Earlier it was 50,000 years, it took 50,000 years for things to change. Then it was 12,000 years for things to change. Then it was 500 years for things to change. Then 50 years, even 50 years before, we find our health, our longevity was only 35 years or 40 years. Now it is 75 years. And 50 years ago, you never thought about uh, TV or uh, modern telephone, uh, cell phones. Now things are changing very fast. So now every five hours, things are changing. So as the Upanishad says, this ever-changing world of ever-changing events, nothing repeats. Everything is random, as they say. It's a randomized and chaotic and anarchic world that we are living. And therefore, going back to the past and collecting data and trying to predict the future will no more work. We need another source of information. And that source of information is the self, not the memory. Not even the outside world, because outside the world is constantly changing. So there is only one changing substratum in all our experience. And that is the self indicated by the I experience, we have seen that indicated by the I experience. So unless you probe, go deep into the I experience and come to the oceanic consciousness and from there we have to get inspiration and get energy, get solution. So one reason for the self-based or self-directed leadership is the world is constantly changing. And the Upanishad gives the idea, therefore don't covet others' wealth. Because by coveting others' wealth, you are forgetting yourself. The greatest wealth is yourself. Infinite ideas are there. So instead of coveting others' wealth and becoming a predator, living a life of aggrandizement, look into yourself and inspire yourself. And then you can get new ideas. And we are, those who have new ideas, they get the cake. They become successful in the world. So Benisha says, don't covet others' wealth. And others' wealth can be the wealth of the nature. Don't exploit nature beyond the limit. Because natural resources are limited. The water resource is limited, oil resource is limited. Gold is limited, iron is limited, coal is limited, trees are limited, everything is limited in nature. 
but the self is unlimited. Ideas are unlimited. So therefore, since the natural resources are limited, you have to turn within yourself for inspiration and for solutions to the ever-changing problems of the world. That is one reason why we are thinking of self-directed leadership rather than knowledge-directed leadership, data-driven leadership, or even imagination-driven leadership, we have to go within ourselves. That is one reason. Another reason is, now this, the, the data, the enormous data is collected these days from the social media, social platforms, or by survey, and uh, Enormous data is collected and then data is analyzed and they are trying to predict. And most of the time their predictions come true in the sense they are able to control your behavior. Because of the data collection, they are able to control your behavior because you have an access to the self. So we have become a mechanical pe people. Our behavior is influenced by advertisement. Our behavior is influenced by what our neighbors are doing. Our behavior is influenced by the government policies. So we lost our self. As a result of that, we are become pure automatons, machines. And if you are a machine, your behavior can be predicted. So I am afraid a world will come, a tomorrow or a day after tomorrow, a central government sitting in New Delhi or Beijing or Washington will be able to control our behavior because we lost touch with ourselves so that our behavior is all mechanical behavior. We do the same thing, we consume the same thing and we are influenced by advertisement. That is loss of your freedom. Your identity is lost. So unless we go into the self, we will not be able to enjoy a free life. A central government will be able to control you by pressing a button. They can decide what kind of shoes you will choose, what kind of food you will choose, what kind of clothing you will choose. Everything can be controlled by the center. So for our own sanity and freedom, we must explore our self. And that self is not available for data. Because self cannot be objectified. Please understand that. Your self cannot be objectified. It cannot be put under a stethoscope or a periscope or a, or a microscope. Because the self cannot be objectified. Since self cannot be objectified, nobody can collect any data about the self. Nobody can predict your behavior. You become unpredictable. That is your freedom. Predictability is not freedom. If I can predict your behavior, then you are like an animal, you are like a machine. Even animal's behavior we cannot predict. But a machine behavior you can predict. So if you want to really enjoy freedom, you have to live in the self, a self which cannot be objectified. There is no data about the self. So that is the second reason, to declare your freedom, to live a free life, we must live in the self. And the third reason is, since the world is constantly changing and you need new, new solutions to the ever-changing world, unless you explore the inner self, there is no way of creating new solutions. The new solutions are to be created. If you create a new solution, you are always in the forefront. You are always the leader. A leader is one who creates new solutions to the ever-changing problems of the world. So these are the three reasons that I can give you for recommending self-directed leadership, not knowledge-directed leadership, not data-directed leadership, not uh, imagination-based leadership. Even your imagination is limited. How much you can imagine? Your imagination is based upon your knowledge. Suppose if I ask you, okay, imagine, think about uh, New York. You can imagine about New York because you read something about New York or you, you heard from somebody. 
based upon that no knowledge you imagine about New York. But when you go to New York, it can be a totally different experience for you. So imagination also is based upon knowledge, based upon the past. It is only you're extrapolating something from the past. And hence, the case for the self. The self keeps your freedom. Without the self, you cannot be free. Otherwise, you become a machine. You become predictable. You can be controlled by the big brother sitting in New Delhi or Washington or Beijing. You will be controlled and you will become mere animals or automatons. That will be loss of our freedom. So to maintain our freedom, it is very important that we go into the self. Now, how do we do that? So the Upanishad says, those who are disconnected from the self, because you are preoccupation with the material world, that is how you disconnect from the self. I am preoccupied with the material world. I think my happiness is in the material world. My happiness depends upon what I have, with whom I am, where I live. So if your happiness depends upon the other, what you have, then you lost your freedom. Then you are alienated from the self. Then you feel eccentric because you are off the center. And hence, the Upanishad says, those who have lost the self, atma hano janaha, those who have forgotten their self, those who have lost their self, those who have deviated from the self. How do you deviate from the self? By desiring happiness in the outer world. Ultimately, our pursuit is happiness. Whether you sit on the Prime Minister's chair, or you're crawling on the ground, or you're sleeping on the railway station, or you're doing a million dollar business, ultimate objective is to be a happy person. And unfortunately, we are seeking happiness outside. And the moment you seek happiness outside, you are deviated from your center. You lost your soul. You lost your sanity, you lost your center, and you are off the center, which is called being eccentric. So the Upanishad says, the wisdom of the Upanishad is very, very profound. Our problem is we lost the wisdom of the Upanishad. The Upanishad says, Atma Hano Janaha, one who has forgotten himself. Atma Hano Janaha, he's called a suicide. Actually, we all have committed suicide. Why? We've forgotten ourselves, and we are lost in the material world. Therefore, instead of becoming the master of the material world, you have become a slave of the material world. People say, I am taking my dog for a walk. You are not walking, the dog, dog is walking you, isn't it? You have become a slave of the dog, wherever the dog goes, because you are lost in your own thoughts. So log tucks at the leash and then you fall down. The dog is walking you, you are not walking the dog. The world is controlling you, you are not controlling the world. You are not a master, you are a slave at this point. You don't take your own decision, the world is provoking decisions out of you. Thus we have lost our sovereignty, we lost our uh, freedom. So the Upanishad puts it very succinctly, the Upanishad says, Atma hano janaha, those people who live in ignorance or forgetfulness of their self, they live in a world of darkness. They just wander in the world of darkness, blindly, like a blind man moving around. We lost our destination, we lost our direction, we lost our purpose, we lost our joy of living in this world. We live in a little box. The box is called Dukkha. Dukkha box we are living. That's why you ask anybody, how is things? Ah, chalta hai. There's no other answer. There is a very miserable, cynical answer comes out of him. Chalta hai. Some or other I am managing. But I feel suffocated. I feel boxed. Even a leader, even a prime minister, he should not be controlled by the post that he is holding. He should control the post. And for that, he must strike deep roots into his own soul, or his own self, or his own Atman. 
So this being the case, how do I reflect upon my Atman? How do I go deep into my Atman? Upanishad gives you some mantra. Upanishad says, Sappadriyagat chukramagayam avranam masnaviram Shuddham ababa vidham Kavirmanishi paribhu soyam buhu Yadhata dhyadhartan vidadat shashodhi bhyasama bhyaha You need some words to explore yourself. These days they call it neuro-linguistic programming. Because our thoughts, our vision, our idea about ourselves, our thoughts, our intentions, our words are all determined by these words. Our thoughts also are influenced by words. If you think I am a useless person, then you are useless. If you think I am a useful person, then you are useful. If you think I am a happy person, you are happy. If you think I am an unhappy person, you are unhappy. As you say, so you become. As you think, so you become. The so words play a very important role. Actually, our brain is made up of words. That's why children, as they grow up, they keep asking questions. Ye kya hai, wo kya hai? And you get tired of answering their questions, isn't it? But you must engage the children in conversation. They have to pick up new, new words. They have to see many things. As they see things, all their pictures, their images are registered in the brain. On one side the images, other side the words, and your capacity to think to, it depends upon how you connect images with the words. It's symbolic thinking. So you can, you have to use these words of the Upanishad so that one can get an idea or insight or an experience of the self. The Upanishad says, this self we are talking about, Paryagad. All pervasive. It is everywhere. There is no place it is not. That is yourself. Meaning, I am everywhere. Think of that. You are everywhere. But you think you are sitting on the chair, isn't it? You are sitting on the chair. That is what you are thinking. Your body is sitting on the chair, not you. That shift has to happen. My body is sitting on the chair and the chair and the body in which sits on the chair, both are sitting in your mind. Where does the chair sit? In your mind. Where does the body sit? On the chair. The body and the chair both sits in your mind. Your mind is a series of thoughts. And where do those thoughts sit? In your consciousness, he says. Think of that your consciousness. In that consciousness a thought. Thought produces the body and the chair, etc. So ultimately you are pure consciousness. We have seen it yesterday. Your pure consciousness. And the consciousness has no temporal or spatial limitation. Because time, space, continuum exist as a fluctuation in that consciousness. Meditate on that. Then you understand, I am not just the body, I am not just the thought, I am not just the ego, I am that timeless, spaceless, eternal consciousness. This is what you have to repeat again and again. As a leader, you have to repeat, as a decision maker, as a student, as a father or a mother or a citizen, you have to continuously repeat this, I am that infinite consciousness, Shivoham, Shivoham. This is the meaning of Shiva. Shivoham does not mean you, have, you dress up like Shiva, like a jada and snakes and all that. That is not Shiva. Swamiji, you told me Shivoham, so I am coming in this dress. You don't have to dress up like Shiva. You are Shiva right now. Own it up. Accept it. So I am that all pervasive conscious. Saparyagad, he says. It's everywhere. Saparyagad, shukram, and it is pure. It's absolutely pure. So he says, Saparyagad, shukram, it is absolutely pure. And Kavir Manishi, and he is a supreme intelligence. 
all your resources can be tapped from there. So first of all, we have to convince ourselves, I am that infinite consciousness. And with the help of these Upanishad words, you will be able to reach that state in contemplation. That is what we are talking, contemplative action. Contemplative action means always understand that my nature is this, my nature is that bliss and happiness. So all your actions become a tool or a channel for expressing that happiness. That is what the Upanishad says. You have to understand the self through contemplation. Otherwise, you will be living in a limited space, maybe determined by the body or your thought, your ego. You cannot go beyond that. So we need a contemplation and contemplative action or reflective action. So sapparyagat shukram magayam abrunam asnaviram shuddham ababa vidham. And in that state you know that I am not conditioned by past deeds. My past deeds don't condition me. Because your past deeds, good and bad deeds you have done, that is done and gone. Don't worry about that. You can always renew yourself, rejuvenate yourself. So don't sit and worry about what I have done in the past, what I have not done in the past, this what I have done, the commissions and omissions of the past should not disturb you. The past is like a wave in the ocean, as a wave in your consciousness. So with this understanding, the past is no more a burden upon you. Anyway, the past is of no use in making decision. So understand that. I am that all-pervasive consciousness. But at this point, we think I am the body. The moment you think you are the body, you are limiting yourself. It's a self-created limitation. So take the help of the Upanishad, believe in the Upanishad, and continue to repeat this. Shivoham, Shivoham, I am that infinite consciousness. I am that source of all energy and power and bliss and happiness. Keep on thinking like that. Now the, your question is, if I think, will I become that? That is another question. If I think I am Birla, will I become Birla? If I think I am Bill Gates, will I become Bill Gates? If I think I am Modi, will I become Modi? Surely you will not, because you are not Modi. You are not Birla. You are not Bill Gates. But here, you are this Satchidananda. You are that infinite consciousness. Therefore, the problem is you don't recognize that. So these words are very important. These words will help you recognize that. It's a problem in the brain. It's a cognitive problem. A cognitive problem can be challenged and solved by use of words. This is what we call neuro-linguistic reprogramming. We have to reprogram ourselves continuously, repeating that then I understand my happiness is my nature. I don't have to seek happiness outside. If I seek happiness outside, then I miss that. So when I don't seek happiness, I am, I become or I realize my happy nature. So when you are happy, you have infinite resources. When you are unhappy, you have no resources at all. So a happy person become a very creative person. A happy person become a loving person. A happy person become a non-violent person. It is only unhappy people who become violent, who become a predatory lifestyle is developed by such people. So having understood that, so take the help of the Upanishad to discover yourself. Don't think if you sit under a tree and close your eyes, you will discover yourself. Not possible. Please, that is a mistake we are making. I'll sit under a tree, close my eyes, then you will only sleep. That's why most of you in the name of meditation, you are sleeping. Because you are not challenged by words. That neuro-linguistic reprogramming is not happening. You only go to deep sleep. So you must be challenged by the Upanishadic statements which goes against your present idea about yourself. 
when the Upanishad statesmen will challenge you. When you say, I am a worm, the Upanishad says, no, you are Amrudasya Putraha. You are the children of immortality. Maybe that's why Swami Vivekananda said, go around the country teaching the Upanishad. The Upanishad gives you a message of fearlessness. Upanishad gives you the idea of who you are. So, Sapparyagat Chukram, Asnaviram, Ababavidham, take up that particular sloga and keep meditating on that, you will be able to realize your true nature as that infinite self. That's why I said it is no more data-based leadership, analytics-based leadership. It is self-directed leadership. And the self is your happy, natural consciousness. So from today onwards, don't say I am the body. You can say I have a body, but I am not the body. I have a mind, but I am not the mind. I have a house, but I am not the house. I have a buffalo, but I am not the buffalo. Do, can you say that I have a buffalo that I, because of that I am a buffalo? I have a donkey, I am not the donkey. I have a computer, I am not the computer. I have a car, I am not the car. Thus, what you have, that you are not. That's an ironclad law in self-realization. In self-understanding, this is the law. What I have and what I don't have do not define my true nature. My true nature is Satchidanandam. Satchidanandam. Sadanandam. Sadanandam. So these Swamis are given the name Sadananda, isn't it? Sadananda go to America. Americans cannot this pronounce the aspirate sounds. So instead of Sadananda, he becomes Sadananda. Sadananda, Sadananda, Sadananda. After hearing Sadananda for a couple of times, he really believed that he is Sadananda. Then he came back to India as a Sadananda. He went to America as Sadananda. Always happy. He comes back as Sadananda. See how words play its magic and its trick in your mind. So never ever use negative words. Always use positive words. Never ever use negative words against your subordinates. Because if you use negative words about your subordinate, you get a negative person to work with. Never ever use negative words about your children. Because if you use negative words about your children, you get a negative child. Never ever use negative words about your spouse. Because if you say you get a negative spouse, and you are coming to a me, why my wife is not listening to me? It's your problem. You are using negative words to suppress them, to control them, to reduce them to status of a thing. Because a thing you can control, a person you can never control. A person will challenge you. There is a mutual gaze between you and me, isn't it? When I look at you, you look at me also. You assess me, I assess you. But when I look at that furniture, it doesn't look at me. So I am very comfortable. It doesn't challenge me. It doesn't ask me questions. So I feel very comfortable near the furniture. But then I am not challenged. I am not exploring myself. But with you, you challenge me. I challenge you. We explore each other. It's like two mirrors kept against each other. It creates a great depth. So this challenging is very, very important. So these words are very, very important. Otherwise, we will still remain in the old feeling that I am a very limited person. You are not limited. You are a limitless person. You are a person without boundary. You are a unique person. This idea is to be cultivated. That's why we say it is self-directed leadership. Now, one more reason we have seen. These days, all of us are aspirational people. We have dreams. We have unique dreams. You don't want to repeat what others have done. Because if you repeat what others have done, you become a carbon copy. 
So I want to live my life in my own way. I want to explore my uniqueness. And uh, we all are unique people. You take the thumb impression, everybody, each one of you have different thumb impression. Earlier you used to put thumb impression to identify, isn't it? A document you put your thumb. And then that shows your uniqueness. Thereafter it becomes a signature. Signature can be repeated. A smart guy can, can simulate your signature. But thumb impression cannot be repeated. So we are com coming back to thumb impression age now. Earlier it was thumb impression, then you are educated, then you start signing your name, now it is again back to thumb impression. That shows we all are unique individuals. And unless you express your uniqueness, you will not feel fulfillment. Otherwise you will be repeating what others are doing. So we are unique individuals, we have unique dreams, and we want to contribute something to the world in our own way. Then alone you feel an authentic life. Otherwise it is simple repetition. You get bored with the life. I find most of the people, even leaders, leaders also are bored. Sitting in that highest chair, they become bored. When they become bored, they become violent. Stalin was a violent leader because he was all alone on the top. He is bored with the life. So he killed 30 million people because he was bored with the life. Whereas Mahatma Gandhi never sat anywhere. Look at his lifestyle. He never sat anywhere. He was constantly on the move. He is being challenged and he was challenging. He argued with everybody. He argued with Subhas Bose, he argued with the Tagore, he argued with the Nehru, he argued with the Patel, he argued with the Jinnah. He argued with everybody. Mahatma Gandhi. He liked a challenge. He did not try to destroy or put down anybody. So Mahatma Gandhi was always on the move. Because he was always on the move, chare vedi, chare vedi. He could live in the splendor and the power of the spirit. So Gandhi talked about the soul force, not the brute force. You become a non-violent individual. A non-violent person is one who accommodates everybody, who gives a place for all unique individuals. Like a garden where every bush brings a new flower. What they call, let a million flowers bloom. So since you have your own unique destiny and mission in this world, so that unique destiny and mission is with reference to your body, mind, ego, complex. So when you use the word I, there are two meanings for that. Please think about that. And we all use the word I, isn't it? I did it. I went to there. I talked to that person. I came back home. I had my dinner. And then I had a glass of hot milk. Then I hit the bed. I slept, I dreamt, I woke up. This I never leaves you. Does it ever leave you? So that I, that I has got two references. One reference is your body, mind, ego, complex. This is your unique personality. That's a unique personality. Your body, mind, ego, complex is different from my body, ego, complex. Even though you are my son. Even if you are my son, your body, mind, ego complex will be different from my body, ego complex. Body, mind, ego complex. That is one reference. Other reference is that universal consciousness. So that universal consciousness we all share. But Bhagavad Gita said, Brahma Vam Shivayam. We all spring from the same source. But we also have this unique body, mind, ego complex, as an instrument with which we interact with the world. So since all of us have our own dreams, all of us has got our own aspirations, those dreams and aspirations has been fulfilled in interacting with the world. And that is why the modern young people, they are aspirational people. 
they want to create their own destiny they want to write to their own destiny rather than following anybody else and hence we find all of us are leader there are no more followers in the world today earlier we are the we had the binary a few leaders and majority followers now there are nobody want to follow anybody i tell you everybody want to follow the other person i don't want to follow you if possible i would like to follow you so since all of us are leaders all of us are leaders because if you are a leader then you have to since you are a leader you have to take inspiration from yourself you no more take inspiration from data that is why we become leader i have to go into myself i have to strike roots into myself i have to live my unique life i have to contribute something to the world if your ambition is to contribute something unique to the world and add a new few color and flavor to the tapestry of the world there is only one way go deep into yourself lead a reflective life so thus we understand first let us go into the depth of our self don't depend upon data or memory or descriptions that others give you at this point i remember a story somebody was invited to get keynote address a keynote address in a convocation ceremony all young people are sitting in front of him and he came to deliver the keynote address and the person who introduced him said here is mr kumar swami invested a lot of uh, invested in the stock market and made a lot of money because they want to inspire the students what is his credential to give a keynote address because he invested in the stock market and made a lot of money mr kumar swami he lives in calcutta this was the introduction now when kumar swami stand came and he introduced himself in a different way he said i never lived in calcutta i never lived in calcutta and i never invested in the stock market i had a startup and made some money in that and finally my name is not kumar swami my name is john my name is not kumar swami so the idea is that when people introduce you that introduction doesn't seem to be true you have to give your own introduction don't let others introduce you give your name and control you you have to give then you become a really creative young individual so thus we are unique in certain aspects body mind ego we all have body mind and ego we have it we are not that we have it like a tool so we have to use that tool while we are interacting with the world the purpose of life according to the upanishad is to express your joy which is natural to you does it make any sense to you the purpose of life according to obenishas is not to expect joy or happiness from the world but to express your happiness while you are interacting with the world so we have this unique body mind ego complex as a tool to interact with the world and you are a leader and you don't have to follow anybody you don't have to ape anybody once you ape anybody you become a thing you are not a person and you are really a person a unique person so this unique body mind complex which you have is to be used to interact with the world so worldly interaction become very very important to realize your own potential your own destiny your own mission in this world and hence upanishad says vidyam cha vidyam cha yastad vedo bhayam saha avidya amrutyam tirtva vidya amrutam ashnudey says vidya means the world the world is called avidya in the upanishad world is called avidya how how do you call the world avidya avidya means ignorance 
the world as such you don't understand the world the we don't know what the world is we know the world what is reported by the sense organ whatever the sense organ report to you that alone you know it is something like you take a vessel to the ocean and take uh, uh, water in the vessel and bring to home and that water in the vessel is nothing comparable to the the oceanic water isn't it that's a little limited water the ocean is limitless so similarly from the oceanic world your sense organs pick up five data five sensation and the mind process those data depending upon your biological needs please the sense organs harvest data from the world what are the data five data sound touch smell taste and sight that's all what the sense organs pick up and the sense organs got its own limitation and you process that data depending upon your biological state there is biological need what is your biological need to survive that is why you are able to distinguish between a tiger and a cauliflower though the tiger also comes as the sense data cauliflower also comes as its sense data but your biological need is you must be able to distinguish from that cauliflower from the tiger otherwise you will go and embrace the tiger and that will be the last embrace that you will have you must be able to distinguish between so the world that you see is only a phantom world it is only a shadow world it is only an interpretation to suit your biological needs you don't know the world actually the actual world is far beyond the ken of your sense organs or what you pick up from the world is only like a bucket of water from the ocean that doesn't give you a true picture of the world that makes you very humble that makes you very humble you can no more say i know everything i i heard a story that a person uh, went to a hotel and asked for a room with a view to the ocean he asked for a room with a view to the ocean so the counter boy said sir i am sorry i don't have a room with a view to the ocean but i can give you a room with a bucket of water taken from the ocean he said it doesn't help isn't it it doesn't help so what do you know of the world is very superficial maybe when you have yogic drishti you may see the world better but the bhoga drishti at this point we have a bhoga drishti bhoga drishti means i want to control and enjoy the world with that bhoga drishti you may not be able to see the world as it is so you have this unique instrument the body mind ego complex and you have the world outside and you have the self so there are three you are a composite of three entities the world in which you are of which you are a part your unique instrument the body mind ego complex and your self this is how we understand our self so the upanishad says the world is avidya a product of your ignorance product ignorance means to ignore the whole and focus on a part that's the meaning of ignorant you don't see the world in its entirety you only pick up whatever is necessary for you therefore your knowledge of the world is called a product of ignorance a product of partial view it's a partial understanding of the world but that is enough for you that is enough to maintain the body mind ego complex that's enough for you so this world with which you are interacting which is avidya and we have to interact with the world because you cannot escape you breathe you drink water eat food to maintain the body mind ego complex isn't it you have to drink water you have to eat food you have to breathe and you must have certain temperature to maintain you so you are living in a swim, this this little bubble 3 miles up 3 miles down 
that is the atmosphere or the biosphere, and we are living there as a body-mind-ego complex. Now this body-mind-ego complex is to be used to express your inner joy, he says. So why I am interacting with the world? Some people say I have nothing to do with the world, I am going to retire. Upanishad doesn't recommend that lifestyle. One thing he says, even if you retire from this world, you'll be going to another world. You cannot escape. Wherever you are, you are, there is a world is there. Like a fish cannot escape from the water. The fish get out of the water, it's dead. So wherever you go, even if you go to an ashram, ashram also is a world by itself. More complex than your ho home, I tell you. At home at least you can get a cup of tea in the morning. Ashram you don't get it. You have to go and have a cold ba bath in the morning. In at home at least you can sleep till 11 o'clock. Ashram you cannot. There you have to get up 4 o'clock and do yoga asana. Or chant mantras. So don't have this illusion that by in the ashram I can be comfortable and happy. No. Ashram also has its own problem. Home it has its own problem. So wherever you go, you find only a problem. If there is no problem, you will create problems also. Or somebody will create problems for you. That's why somebody who was too much, you know, he fought with his mother or his wife and his children, he decided to go to the ashram. Without telling anybody, he left. But he went to the ashram, he found that it is more problematic there. So you wrote back home saying that, I'm sorry, I did not tell you, I am in the ashram, I am coming back. The wife wrote back, don't come back, be there, be comfortable there, now you are neither there nor here, he says. So don't think that, if I go to the ashram or to the Himalayas, I can lead a happy life. Happiness is within you, it is not outside. When this understanding comes, you go through a cognitive shift. That cognitive shift is very, very important. The greatest shift you can happen in your life is the knowledge that my happiness is not outside, it is within me. It is my nature. If my nature is not happiness, I'll be unhappy. If my nature is unhappiness, I'll be happy with my unhappiness, isn't it? A simple logic. But it seems that unhappiness is like a thorn that has gone into my flesh. I rebel against it with all my force. I want to get out of, get, get off that unhappiness. So therefore, your body, mind, ego complex is a unique entity. And sometimes people say, give up your ego, which is not possible. Your ego is your unique identity. You cannot give it up. And you have to recognize that. I have a unique identity. So instead of giving up your ego, you must be able to manage your ego in a family of egos. Because I am egoistic, you also are egoistic. I have an identity, you also have an identity. And to express my potential, I have to associate with you. If I have to give a speech, somebody, few people should be there, isn't it? To express my potential, my capability, I need a few more people. If I am a singer, I need a few listeners. If I am a businessman, I need customers. If I am a teacher, I need students. If I am a prime minister, I need citizens. So we all, this is a reciprocal relationship we have. So as a unique individual, body, mind, ego, complex, you need other individuals, any interaction with, which, with whom I can express my potential. Please think of that. So when we talk about egolessness, what we mean is recognize the ego of the other while you are promoting your ego, while you are expressing your, your self, you have to recognize the other people. The recognition or respect for the other person's identity is what is called egolessness. Otherwise, if you re reduce your ego, people will 
walk over you. You will reduce yourself to status of a thing or a furniture. Therefore, you should not eliminate your ego, which is not possible also. And I have seen people who are very humble, but they are very egoistic. They will say, pahale up, pahale up, pahale up, pahale up. Or they may touch your feet so that they can pull your feet later. Isn't it? So anybody who says, I am very humble, I don't need this, please be beware of that people. They are trying to promote their own ego in a very subtle way. They make you disarmed first, then they attack you. Because they say, I am not egoistic. So you are disarmed, then they will attack you. So you always promote your identity, and it's a unique identity. And it is through the unique identity that you can interact with the world, so that you can contribute something on the common good, for the common good. Otherwise, you have nothing to contribute. So the Upanishad says, there are two selves in you. One is the body, mind, ego, self, which is your first understanding about yourself. I have a body, you know that, and you identified with that. I have a mind, you know that, you are identified with that. And you have an identity, ego, you are identified with that. This is all what I know about myself now. By your thinking, this is what I am. With the Upanishad says, there is a deeper I in you. The deeper I, the big I, I should say. This is a small I. In an English, a small I, a bend uh, uh, lion and with a dot on the top. That is a small I. That is your unique body, mind, ego complex. And the Upanishad says, there is something deeper in you. Please discover that. That is discovered in contemplative states with the help of the Upanishad. And the deeper I is that infinite consciousness. So while you are interacting with the world, with your body, mind, ego complex, you must be aware of that infinite consciousness. That is your foundation. So with that understanding, relate with the world, he says. So Upanishad says, avidya and vidya, two states. Avidya means this limited body, mind, ego complex, because it's limited. And then vidya means the deeper awareness that you have, with that, interact with the world. And when you interact with the world, then you become an active person. To be active means receive sensations and respond to that sensation. So become an active person. That is the first step in spirituality. That is the first step in exploring your potential. Become an active person, he said. So spirituality is not passivity. Spirituality, the beginning of spirituality is activity. That's why Swami Vivekananda said, throw away the Bhagavad Gita, jump into the battlefield. Only through football ground you can realize yourself, not in the puja room. It's a very atrocious statement that Swami Vivekananda gave. You can realize your potential, you can grow spiritually by jumping into the football ground, not sitting in the Puja room, he says. Because in Puja room, your challenges are very limited. You cannot explore your potential. You explore your potential by actively interacting with the world. Otherwise, you become a bonsai kind of a tree. Isn't it bonsai tree? Cut the roots. Therefore, it doesn't grow. So that it can be put in the drawing room. But the same tree can become a huge tree outside the world, in the world. Exposing itself to the inclemencies of the weather, heat, cold, rain, then the tree grows to its full potential. So the Upanishad says, be active in the world. It is only by being active in the world you can realize your full potential. You can, re you can come to know who you are. What are the problems of the mind? How does your mind function? Does it make any sense to you? This is a totally different understanding of spirituality. 
our idea of spirituality is I want to retire and go to the ashram and sit there and uh, shake my nose. That's all what we know about spirituality. Where the Upanishad and the Bhagavad Gita says, jump into the world. Because the world is your field. And when you jump into the world, you know who you are. What is your potential? What is your body, mind, ego potential? Who you are? How much you are? All this can be known only by interacting with the world. And as the more you interact, the more you come to know yourself. You become like a huge banyan tree. Otherwise, you remain as a bonsai tree. That is the first principle for your spiritual. What is the spiritual evolution? What is hidden in you is to be manifested. That's the meaning of spirituality. What is invisible has to be made visible. That's the meaning of spirituality. Spirit is that which is invisible. Matter is that which is visible. So making the invisible spirit into visible material objects is called spirituality. Thus Bhagavan or the Upanishad advises be very active. Take the risk. Take the risk. Trust the world. Trust yourself. Take the risk. So once we understand my nature as the body, mind, ego complex and I am a unique individual and unique expression is possible when you interact with the world. The more you interact, the more you express yourself. And through these interactions, your mind manifests. The angularities of the mind become visible. Because when I interact with the world, Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Madha, Matsadriya, Damba, Ahangara, Suya, Irsha, all these manifest. Anger manifest. If you are not interacting with the world, there is no anger, isn't it? When you sit in the Himalayas in a cave, you are not angry. Because you never met anybody. That's why you are not angry. When you come out, Again you are angry. So the anger is like a sediment is there deep in your mind. You are not provoked enough. Because that sediment, you are not able to access the spiritual wealth that you have. Please understand that. You have to be very active in the world. So that you understand your mind. So that you can correct your mind. So that the mind can become calm and quiet and tranquility can be experienced peace can be experienced. So you have to balance the mind in an interactive world, not in the silence of the puja room or the case of the Himalayas. There of course you can look a holy person, but you are a hollow person there. Maybe that is why the Upanishad says, Vidyam cha vidyam cha yastad vedo bhayam saha avidyaya murtim turtva. By actively interacting with the world, promoting your uniqueness, contributing to the world, you are able to murtim turtva. You are able to overcome your fear, overcome your angularities. Murtim means fear basically. Avidyaya murtim turtva. Vidyaya Amrudamashnade. So first you have to become an active person. As a leader. I am talking about you as a leader. You taking charge of your life. That's what leadership is all about. It is not controlling the other leadership. That leadership style is gone. Nobody would like to be controlled. Earlier the idea of leadership is I control you. I take decisions for you. I decide what you should become. Whether you are a parent or a leader or a guru, that is what idea of leadership is uh, all about. I decide for you. No more. Nobody wants to be led by their nose anymore. I must take my own decision. I must probe myself. I must make a mistake. I may make a mistake, doesn't matter. So, interact with the world. So you have a, oh, every individual, there will be 7.2 billion leaders now in the world. All are knowledge people. 
you have access to knowledge. Whether you go to university or not, you have access to all kind of knowledge through the internet. You can sit in your little village and then know the whole world. You have access to that. Even morning breakfast I find, sometimes I stay in individual homes, morning breakfast is a big uh, uh, struggle because the younger one wants to, want uh, milk, other one want salad, third one want uh, uh, oats, the other one want something else. So the mother has to ask everybody, what do you want, what do you need? What? And uh, one, one of them says, I must uh, check the Google. Let me find out through the Google what I need today. Today what is up in the market? Plenty of choices. The world is, the whole world is open to you now. And everybody has access to the world. Earlier knowledge was controlled by uh, the powerful people. Now knowledge is freely available. Everything is available. So choice making is very, very difficult. Deciding is very, very difficult. So therefore, interact with the world. So you understand your mind. You can balance your mind in the process, which is called karma yoga. So when you interact with the world, you become a bhakta. That's the meaning of bhakti. Bhakti means, I see myself as part of the world. As a body, mind, ego complex, I am part of the world. This is called bhakti. So from a bhakta, you are able to manage your mind. When you manage your mind, you get access to the uh, spirit. So that accessing the infinite spirit that you are, the happiness that you are, is possible by interacting with the world, balancing the mind. When you balance the mind, you get access. And once you have access to this infinite resource, which all of us have access, it is not only A or B have access, while you are interacting with the world and with your unique uh, body, mind, ego complex, the mind become calm. You and I have access to the world, isn't it? Sitting in your room, you can get access to what is happening in Washington now, isn't it? For example, Prime Minister Modi is giving a speech from New Delhi. You can sit in your room and flip that channel and you get access. I get access, my neighbor also get access, other person also get access. We are sitting in our own respective drawing rooms and we can access what is happening. In New Delhi, the Prime Minister giving a speech and I can flip uh, my, I can use my remote control and I can get that. And Prime Minister Modi is still giving that speech. Similarly, we all can access that infinite resource and it is inexhaustible resource. Unfortunately, we have no awareness of that. That is why the world is violent. Because those things, resources are limited. Resources are infinite. It is not limited. Ideas are infinite. Provided you go deep into yourself. That is why we say self-directed leadership. Then we all can become leaders. We all can promote ourselves. We not become a predator. We don't become an exploiter. We become, we only exploit our own inner uh, potential. Thus, as Bhagavan says, Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanuddharaha Tatra Shri Vijayaha Bodhihi Dhruva Nidhirma Dhirmama. When you incorporate the Krishna and Arjuna within you, you become the most successful, most happy, most creative individual in the world. So that's the program of leadership that given in the Upanishad. That's why I, I based my talk on the Ishavasya Upanishad. So three things, the world, the body-mind-ego complex, and your infinite potential. And the body-mind-ego complex is different from each individual, they are unique. But if you interact with the world, with this body, mind, ego complex, make your own unique decisions, those unique choices become channel 
of exploring and expressing your uh, potential. This is the scheme given by the Upanishad. And tomorrow I'll give you some case studies, some examples. Some examples from Puranas, from our own tradition, how this can be achieved. What it would, it, how does it look like? This kind of leadership, how does it look like? That's what I will be talking about tomorrow. So I'm sure this, this has provoked a lot of thoughts in you, haven't you? A lot of thoughts. How is it possible? It looks exciting. It looks exciting, but still things are not clear to me. If you have questions, please write down your question. That's the last day for you. Write down your questions, keep it here. And I'll be, uh, I'll try to answer those questions or I'll give you some, some studies, some case studies from Puranas, how this lifestyle is possible. This is the only lifestyle which can take you to your full, realize your full potential. As Abraham Maslow said, we have these various goals in life. First is creature comfort, which I think you all have fulfilled that, creature comfort. You have uh, food and shelter and clothing and everything. Creature comforts are fulfilled. Then second is the security needs. That also you have almost fulfilled. You have some money in the bank. That's why you are sitting here. If you have no money in the bank, I don't think you will be sitting here. So security needs also are taken care of. Third is belonging need. You want to belong to somebody, something. That also is there, you have a family, you are a country, you are a community. Third is power need. Power need means you have to take decisions in that situation. So that also more or less is fulfilled. The fourth, the fifth is self-actualization needs. That is where we are stuck. We feel we are stuck. All of you feel you are stuck. All of you feel you are bored with the life. There's no inspiration, bored with the life. So if you follow this lifestyle, which I have told you, there'll be no boredom in life, he says. In life will be always exciting and inspiring. And you will be unique individual in this world, contributing your unique solutions to the problems of the world. You become a leader, you don't have to be a follower anymore. Each one of you became a leader, provided you follow this self-directed leadership. So thank you very much.